Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Levy, and I'm uh, very excited to be here to talk about some of my favorite parts of the filmmaking process. I uh, just want to start with a clip from a short film I wrote and directed a couple years ago. You know, for the past 15 years or so, I've had one foot in the animation world and one foot in live action. And it's been uh, really an interesting process and an amazing learning experience to get to have the opportunity to create um, movies on both sides of this fence. Um, and it's been really uh, uh, instructive to take lessons from one medium and apply it to the other, and vice versa. Um, when I was at Pixar, I, I worked in the layout department, which is kind of this perfect fusion of uh, these sort of art forms, storytelling is storytelling, filmmaking is filmmaking. Um, but I sort of feel like uh, if you can cultivate um, hard, the hard skills in this sort of sweet spot of intersection where the skill sets overlap, you can really multiply your powers as a filmmaker. You know, I'm trying to do more live action these days. And the thing about live action is that it is terrifying in a way that animation is not. Uh, everything has to kind of come together at the same time on set. On this set, we had horses, extras, uh, 41 people on the call sheet, 35 shots to get done in uh, a day. And to make it work, no matter what level of filmmaking you are engaged in, there's always a lot of compromise um, to make it all work. Um, so as much as I love working with real life physical humans, uh, as an introvert, I'm a lot more comfortable working with crappy previs stand-ins in Blender. Um, why previs? These are my top three reasons. It's kind of a chance to make your movie before you make your movie. It's a chance to make all your mistakes early, get them out, figure out uh, what it is that you, you really want to do without being in this terrifying high stakes situation. It's sort of this safe creative playground to explore and the whole point is to keep it crappy so you can throw things out without feeling bad about it. Um, anytime you are putting your work actually in a timeline, you're actually making a movie. I feel like any time before that, you're kind of guessing. So this is, you know, the, the sooner I can get to a timeline, um, the sooner I can have any confidence that I am on the right track. Tonally, you can try out temp music, scratch dialogue, and have this back and forth looping between the shot design, character blocking decisions, and your edit. And it helps you keep your eye on the ball. Uh, oftentimes, on set especially, it's just very easy to get distracted by things that don't matter. Um, so when you're in this sort of previs space, you're, you're focusing on the end result, um, which is really important. And then also I've found that um, previs really helps uh, well, all the creative conversations that you have with your core collaborators. Filmmaking is such a, a collaborative uh, process and um, it, just having this visual tool to communicate kind of what my vision is has uh, really helped um, get efficient and it allows you to get through your shot list um, with uh, fewer questions and you know, pausing on set for creative conversations and that impacts morale. So I just wanna share a little glimpse behind the scenes on this uh, Western location. It was such a dream come true to get to shoot your entrance in this here. place. So Zach goes on his own and you, uh, you wait just a second. And Surly Man has already crossed, so you kind of do a full 360 yep. kind of thing. Yep. Oh. Hey, what year is it? What year is it? Yeah. Here is uh, eight cameras angle. Um, this is the angle we'll do after that. Or we might let's start wide, actually. We'll, we'll start with that and move in. Um, those are the first three setups. And then we'll pick this up, which is more from this axis over here for her actually getting into position. Oh, thank heavens. This gentleman terrorized by the outlaw Milton. He killed my son. And wait. But ideally, there's a cross there. Mm -hmm. I think you got the wrong guy. Yeah. Oh, it's so scary. Isn't that awesome? It's so cool. Oh my god. Uh, so this is from the short film, The Time-Traveling Sheriff. 
which I got to write and direct for Zach King a couple years ago. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to show kind of a before and after of one of the sequences from this short. Um, and just to set things up, the story that we wrote for this revolves around a, a hat with time traveling uh, powers. Uh, so you put it on and you go back in time. Um, and my goals for the previs, you know, uh, for this sort of pivotal sequence was um, to clearly tell the story. That's always the first goal. Um, and to do justice to the, to the fun of the concept of a time traveling hat. Um, to give it this sort of classic Hollywood cinema feel, kind of inspired by Robert Zemeckis and Back to the Future Part 3. And um, we did have some serious you know, practical constraints, and, and the goal is always to make it look like a million dollars, even if you don't have it. So here's first the previs, followed by the same sequence uh, and the final result. You were right. I just had to keep a lookout. Also, Anna, forgive I'm my voice acting. To be prepping. It's magic, Zach. Real magic. Just put it on. What the? See? Oh my god. We went together. What is this place? I have no idea! We're in the Old West. We're in the Old West! This place is real. These people are... We're, we're actually in... Uh, excuse me? Sir? What year is it? You ain't the brightest fella, are you? You're right. I just had to keep a lookout. Man, I'm supposed to be prepping. It's magic, Zach. Real magic. Just put this on. What is this place? I have no idea! We're in the Old West. We're in the Old West! Excuse me. Hey, excuse me, sir. What year is it? You ain't the brightest fellow, are you? Um, yeah, as you can see, this particular, it doesn't always work out like that, but you know, it's pretty one-to-one, -one, and um, it's, uh, you know, I'm a fan of preparation. There's a lot of tools uh, available to the neurotic film director. Uh, not every tool is right for every project. Generally, I feel like the further down the list you get, the more specific you, you, can, you can be and the more prepared you, you'll be. Um, you know, really the, the, the basis is a shot list and, um, and a script, and you can do a lot with just this. Oftentimes, it makes sense to focus the previs on like the action set pieces or the technically complex things, the, the places where you have the most amount of questions uh, before you go on set. Um, and there are some valid reasons not to do previs. The main one being, it's a lot of work. You're making an animated film before you make a live action movie, so it's, it's, you have to do that on top of your other directing duties in pre-production. Um, so you will run out of time. But I think it's really powerful, and I will do it, you know, anytime I, I have the ability. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit more on the practical side of what the previous process is for me. A lot of this will not be surprising, but anytime I go scout a location, I want to leave with enough data to kind of uh, build a, a virtual set. In this case, instead of using polycam, I just shot video that I then used um, as input for Meshroom, just uh, taking still frames from that video. Um, but polycam is awesome and fast. The issue with uh, 3D um, scanning is that oftentimes it leaves you with a very dense mesh. Um, so first order of business is just making it lightweight enough to use as a set. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of built that out on both sides and focusing on uh, real world measurements. So while you're doing your location scout, take a tape measure. Um, and uh, the next thing is characters. And there's lots of 
options, you know, ways to skin this cat, lots of uh, great rigs online. But in this case, I wanted to get more specific with Zach, and I couldn't um, justify taking time out of his schedule to scan him. So there are tools that allow you to just take a still photo and generate a, um, uh, a full model. And because this is previs, it's supposed to be crappy, and so it doesn't really matter. I just did uh, this version with myself uh, to show. And um, you can rig it with uh, Rigify, uh, pay attention to scale, I'm getting at the right scale. Um, I used Mixamo for um, the rigging process. Look how deformed my face is. It's all perfect, it's just previs. Um, and uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a repetitive process because there are always multiple characters in, uh, in a movie. Um, so the point is to do it as fast as you can without losing a lot of time because um, it's really about communication more than making pretty pictures. Um, so this is kind of the recap of everything I just said. Um, keep it lightweight, use whatever shortcuts you can, and use library linking. So you're gonna basically um, create a, a production uh, structure, a little pipeline for yourself so that you can make updates to the sets or to the characters and have them auto-populate your, your shots. Um, I haven't really used the asset browser, but that would be a great way of doing this. Um, and, you know, all of the real creative decisions happen in the animation phase, uh, and all those skills, those animation skills come into play. Um, again, keep it simple. No IK, no constraints. It's all about storytelling, and oftentimes it makes a lot of sense to Perform the dialogue from your script. Use that as the basis for the rhythm of your, of your scenes. Um, so just throwing that in the uh, video sequence editor. And then the things that are really important, you could do a whole hour-long presentation on, but it's like eye lines, screen direction, shot composition, blocking. These are, <laughs> this is like the core cinematography stuff. This is really where your, uh, your, your eye as a cinematographer and a director come into play. Um, but what an amazing and fun uh, playground it can be in Blender. Um, and then, you know, uh, as opposed to in animation, you can do anything. Um, use what you know about your own production and what equipment you have so that you're not creating impossible shots. Um, so really designing to the specifics of the production you're working on. Um, generally, I animate in the round, maybe a scene um, or a, a section of logical blocking, and then I sort of shoot it from a bunch of angles, use camera um, uh, binding to kind of uh, switch between cameras just to kind of get a, a, a flow for it. But then ultimately I'm editing in another software, so I'll uh, kind of expand each of these cameras. Basically what I am gonna say is, if you're watching this on YouTube, pause this movie right now and go watch Vision for Blender, this amazing talk that, was <laughs> that happened earlier today. That my process is completely deprecated, and from now on, I want to use their incredible tool. It's an amazing talk, so special shout out. Um, just quickly, this is just a placeholder to kind of say, that was the safe exploration that happened in the privacy of my room, but really, it's not where the film is going to get made, so there has to be, uh, this is just a jumping off point for creative conversations, whether it's putting together your final shot list with your DP. In this case, we got very specific about focal lengths and camera moves, and we could even have little uh, thumbnails from the previs, so everyone is on the same page. Or, uh, you know, a prop, a piece of set deck, a stunt, you know, um, the previs can really help your crew uh, in pre-production. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Skywatch, because we haven't covered post -viz, which is the other thing this talk was supposed to be about, but it's basically the same thing, it's just in post. And so after you shoot, you know, after you're working now with, a, with a, an edit, with actually everything you've, you've captured on set, um, the movie changes. And um, in, in the case of Skywatch, a major character is this drone that doesn't exist, and so um, before handing off shots to a visual effects department, I had to kind of prototype and workshop stuff in the edit and wanted to kind of cheaply throw in characters and, and, and get a sense of the flow. So it's just, it's really about quick iteration. Um, I thought it'd be really fun to talk specifically about um, the very end of the movie and the most terrifying moment of my professional life, I would say, uh, getting to shoot this cameo with Jude Law. Um, and yeah, I'll tell you about it as we talk. So this is kind of post this initial thing. I was redesigning 
the, uh, the end of the film after we shot to accommodate this reveal of the villain character. So uh, I kind of did a digital takeover here, and I was like, okay, what if we push into this laptop, this important prop, let's introduce the character with his hand first, tilt up um, to reveal. Some tech support. This is what we ended up sh like sending to Jude Law. And here I am. So basically, he said yes. I was going to fly to London to shoot Jude Law for an hour with a crew that I had never met. And I was freaked out, because it's scary to be in that <laughs> situation. So I, um, I did everything I can. This is more like tech viz, where it becomes less about creatively problem solving, in terms of what do I want to do, and more about how are we going to do it. So this uh, stage was modeled to the dimensions of the stage that we're at. Here I'm auditioning different uh, diameters of circular track, trying to, uh, auditioning different focal lengths. This character is Jude Law's height. You know, I wanted to have no questions. Um, I also uh, wanted, I wanted the camera to arc, but I also wanted it to, to push. So I ended up um, coming up with this idea with the and, DP. Uh, so this is the, this is a three foot slider. We are looking at a 52 degree uh, angle here. So I think in either case, two sections of track should probably do it. And then I've got three kinos set up here. One is mounted to the would have to be mounted to the ceiling and uh, the other two on stands um, to light the green screen and then I've kind of... So, what was pretty incredible to see is that because of all this sort of previs work that I had done, I could sh kind of show up to set and it was all magically just happening with a bunch of strangers I had never met. It was happening the way that I planned it and as you can see, the camera's on a slider on a circular track and it's pretty amazing to use these skills in Blender to take what would otherwise be terrifying and kind of execute the vision. I'm gonna need some tech support. Copy that. Thank you very much.